Sri Heblika, renowned actor from famous environmentalists, Dr. Mutkavi, head of Poor PI, Dr. Booming advisor MND is with me, Dr. Manju Prasad, he is also our advisor works and services and chief scientist, Mr. Vishwanath, he is the uh, administration officer. This is Malika Kumar. She is the chief of administration. We call it as controller of administration. And Dr. Mathur, he is our uh, CFD. We call it as computational fluid dynamics as well as business development and program management head. So this is what people hear, sir, but the whole NL is uh, logged in and they will be looking for your very valuable address. I must thank uh, you to accept our invitation in a very short time. And uh, you know, sir, today we are meeting here to celebrate 150 years of celebration of the Mahatma. Yeah. And I mean, everybody knows about uh, Mahatma Gandhi, his story of heroic effect to establish the values of truth and non-violence in the human life. So he has been known for it. And we know how our nation is benefited by him. And he has created an atmosphere which made it possible for our other countries also. You have to see, not only our country, other countries like Asia, Africa also got freed themselves by adopting his uh, messages. So it's yeah. a great pride for us, sir, today that uh, we are meeting here for in commemoration of the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, who we call it as father of our nation. And, it, and he has been called both at national and international level. And we are we would like to propagate this message to all of our colleagues in NL. Sir, we at CSR NL last two years initiated a lot of initiatives from the Swachh Bharat Abhiya, and we have done a lot of renovations in all our working place and colonies. Also, a lot of sanitations and all has been improved to give a good and healthy life to our employees. So, a lot of expenditure has been done on to that and meticulously followed by me. And you, uh, once this pandemic gets over, I invite you as a personal invitation to you to visit yes. our campus and that, and we will take you around. So with okay. this uh, thing, sir, uh, uh, I, I, am, uh, I am glad to introduce you to all the audiences. Yes. We have today a distinguished guest and renowned actor come famous environmentalist, Sri Suresh Evlikar, and it is my uh, pride to introduce him to all of us. He is the Kannada filmmaker, director and actor. He is also a well-known environmentalist founding the Echo Watch NGO in 1998. He has produced many noteworthy movies in Kannada of which Kadina Benki won Best Kadina. Director Kadina Benki won Best Director National Award and Usha Kiran the Film Fair Award. His movie themes involves psychosis and scientific temperaments, which Sis Eblikar humbly attributes to its association with producer and psychoanalysts, Dr. Ashok Pai. Being an environmentalist himself, his movies depict nature and conversation. Sri Suresh Eblikar had his early education at presentation convent and Vessel Mission School, Darwad. He completed his bachelor degree from Karnataka College and postgraduate degree from Karnataka University, Darwad. He has many number of awards and uh, accolades. Uh, and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, yes. Mr. Distinguished thank Speaker. You. And all of us are uh, waiting for your message. Yeah, maybe if you. if you permit me, yeah. uh, I would like yes. to say just a few, few words. Right. I'll just add to what you said. Okay. On, on. It, it's on. You can hear me, right? I'm audible, no? Yes, it's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so in fact, I think more. Uh, I met him personally more recently, 
uh, owing to a common friend uh, of course who is right now in paris and uh, i have seen his films many a times many a times and one of the thing that impressed me was uh, pratham oshakirana quite a bit because it was kind of relating to my own life because in that he is a person who goes abroad and comes back and tries to you know understand the mix of cultures so we also went through that some of us went through that so it was like a, almost like a direct connect and uh, uh, in that actually when i started reading about his uh, work uh, he brings in the elements of you know like uh, environment through his childhood which he actually depicts in that uh, movie as well uh in fact you know those the many of the interesting things are there in that movie uh more recently has been talking about uh, wasteful practices in movies i think he is very much against uh, wasteful practices and i understand that you know in one of the movies he used only the natural available light no additional light in film making uh so there are certain uh, experiments that he has done and uh, uh when you actually sit with him and talk to him it's a very engaging conversation and uh, the the amount of knowledge that he has about our environment uh, is quite amazing and then that is something that you know uh, can only come through some conversations and I, i'm quite sure today he will uh, tell a lot about those things as well and just to i think the, the connected subject that we have chosen today uh, about impact of environmental det- deterioration on economy and uh, sustainability because he i think you know it also kind of relates to gandhian values because you know anything that you impact uh, upon the environment is like practicing violence on the environment and if you if you actually go by the gandhian values that you live more naturally and don't practice you know wastefulness uh, is very much in the gandhian value uh, and he he has been talking about those things recently and uh, he is very concerned about the sustainability and looking for organizational support wherever possible for his efforts and I, and I, we do uh, with the permission of uh, sri jadav ji director nl we will support in whatever way possible for your fight uh, against any environment destruction in the name of development development has to be meaningful and it can be done i think it's not that no, i think that's what he yeah. believes uh, so i just thought i will add these few words uh, thank uh, you due to my personal connect with him okay yeah thank you please thank you sir thank you thank very much thank you sir pro pro is yours you can start yeah so thank you uh, the director of nal and uh, dr gupta vi who has invited me for this uh, kind of a talk on environment i have been especially very happy to be associated with a great number of scientists and uh, uh you know experts who are there in this organization although i said uh, i would be feeling a little nervous to talk about it because the scientists have very precise way of understanding uh the impacts of uh, you know the environmental deterioration on so many uh you know, resources of life however since this today i mean you have chosen this day to be uh, i mean to be associated with the environmental talk on the gandhi 150th year of gandhi's birth anyway and uh, i am particularly very happy as the dr mukavi was saying a little while ago that i do discuss gandhi it is because today the world is thinking about mahatma gandhi because as you know that the world is threatened by environmental changes like you know the climate change the global warming which have taken place in the last 200 years there are books you know which have been written about environment which uh, talk about the way of life people lived on this earth 200 years ago they were much peaceful and uh, more balanced with nature although of course there were a lot of uh, ailments like you know, big diseases like plague and all that but uh, humanity has been consistently working on finding out solutions for various issues various problems including the diseases and i remember a great film where peter otol said that the humanity has fought against a lot of issues you know which would have wiped out humanity from the earth but then people have dedicated themselves like mary curie and so many others and uh, they found out a uh, lot of solutions 
to the problems which were pervading the whole world. So similarly, we have today a pandemic like the COVID-19, with it. it has spread to the whole world. But I'm sure that uh, Oxford University is trying to find out a vaccine, perhaps which is on the brink of this coming out. And also in India, about three firms are working on that. So, uh, you know, perhaps we will find out maybe much earlier a solution, a kind of a vaccine for this uh, disease and uh, the, the life will be normal. But as you know, that uh, in the last two, three months, there were more talks on environment as a result of pandemic. The pandemic slowed down the economic activities in the world. As you know that when the lockdowns were announced in India, like say maybe in Bangalore, for nearly one or two months, we started seeing the beautiful, you know, the trees, there were not much garbage on the road, not many people moving on the vehicles, and then the air was much clearer, and there was not much of air pollution, soil pollution, water pollution, because people were getting stuck at home, and they were doing work from home work, as you know, work from home. And then also, a lot of economic activities were down. But that also, for a country like India, which has more than 1.3 billion people, our economy is very important. We have to survive eventually. Although we have to care for environment, but uh, the survival is, is the biggest issue. That is why for many, many years, people have been saying that we have a great population. We have to address this rise in the population is the biggest issue for environment. Because today, in the last 200 years, with the increase in the science and technology, the advancement in science and technology, many products have come. We didn't have a computer maybe 20, 30 years ago. We didn't have so many cars that we have today. We didn't have so many computers that, I mean, so many other products like mobile phones, smartphones, iPhones, so many things which are being very randomly used all over the world today. We are not there. We should understand when we talk about these small products, they are manufactured in millions and billions. So we need raw material, we need energy to manufacture, we need place to manufacture. And then when we manufacture, we go in search of minerals, we go in search of oil, we go in search of energy, because they cannot be just produced out of thin air. We have to produce them using the natural resources. So when we use natural resources, we don't think about how much we are depleting the natural resources. How long are we going to get these natural resources? You know, how long? So today, as I said, 200 years later, when uh, the Western civilization went through for almost for about 150 to 125 years, uh, sort of a Western civilization, they established a kind of an industrial revolution. They manufactured everything from a pin to an, uh, you know, to a space technology. They manufactured cars, they manufactured cycles, they manufactured so many things. Unfortunately, we could not manufacture many things. We have to understand it. We are now on the assembly line. For instance, the cars are being made. So Japan has come. Maybe America was also here with the General Ford company. They were trying to manufacture cars, getting the parts from there, getting some parts manufactured here only. So it was an assembly line. Similarly, there were many, many products which were being on the assembly line basis. We were manufacturing them here. But we did not produce a cycle, we didn't produce a camera, we didn't produce a car. What why I'm trying to say this is in the process of manufacturing of various products, we come across issues of pollution, issues of economics, issues of you know expenditure, how and issues of you know science and technology, because we have to bring a lot of materials, convert them into various products so that they get you know they get uh, fitted into a particular design that we are thinking of and then make a product maybe like a computer, maybe like a camera, maybe like a uh, car or whatever it is. So in the process, like for instance, the Western civilization built the cities. The cities were built by the farmers, actually. If you look into the history of the American history, they say the cities were built by farmers. What is the farmers who told the youngsters who are involved in manufacturing, who are involved in getting things and all. They said the, the pollution is happening out of only one place and the pollution is coming into the houses. 
maybe the dirty water, maybe the soil, maybe the water, maybe the air. They said, please go away from the village, set up your units there and manufacture. The youth, the youth went, but then they found out that they were not getting food you know, in time and all. They said, how do we live? The farmer said, we will produce everything and bring to you. So we will build. Uh, so it is the farmers who allow the youngsters to start, you know, setting up units. Uh, I mean, sociologically, I have studied it. So the cities were built by them. Today, we are building cities. Now, the cities in India have become a big bane for environment and also for, uh, so, you know, for, for the government. But the governments are yet to understand the issues of the big cities. Because Bangalore, as you know, about 20 years back, Bangalore is a much beautiful place. We had many lakes. Bangalore had about 1,000 lakes, small, medium size, and large lakes, like Belandur. Now, Belandur Lake, which is about 1,000 acres, it is not being addressed at all. There has been only talk. Even New York Times, you know, he wrote about that issue. The foams were coming on the road. There was a friction of the, uh, you know, certain chemicals like detergents and all that, which was being used in the houses which was uh, flushed through the STP and this STP water was getting into <coughs> the Belandur Lake. So th through the fiction, there was uh, this foam, the foam was getting, you know, inflamed by the you know, frictions and uh, th that was it. But then we have been only addressing it, but we have not been able to solve. The grapes of Bangalore, which produce a wonderful wine earlier, today they are not in a position to do that because they are not getting that kind of a soil, they are not getting the kind of water, because water of the lakes is very important, not only for producing vegetables and fruits, but the way how the lake, you know, if you go to a village, you look at a lake, the lake has a beautiful large catchment area. What is a catchment area? The area around the lake, that is where the rainfall comes, it goes through the, you know, the soil, through the bushes, through the grassland, takes the micronutrients from the soil, so the aquaculture of the lake you know, flourishes, like the fish and all that. But today, we are trying to desilt the lake. We put the JCB, the big uh, technological you know, product like the JCB. The JCB lifts the soil. All the nutrients are taken away from the, from the, the soil bed, the water bed, the lake bed, and then the fish don't survive. So we have to understand it. How do you do it? I mean, so we say that, okay, we are building a road, then there's certain flowers, certain grassland is being created. So people start walking, oh, so beautiful lake, beautiful lake. But the lake is only a dead water. You will go to only the rains on the water sheet, not from the catchment area. So we have destroyed a lot of catchment areas in building the cities. A lot of uh, shopping malls have come, a lot of houses have come, housing layouts have been roads have been made, infrastructure has been there. For the last 20 years, the governments have been spending money on infrastructure. Thousands of crores. We have seen the metro line, we have seen four lane roads, six lane roads, eight lane roads are coming now, cutting down the trees, cutting down the forests. Now the forests are important. We all know that we learned when we were in the schools, we learned that the civilizations were built on the banks of the river. So the river, created something with the boating and all that. We created agriculture using the water from the river, horticulture, and it had to be taken to other areas where there were no rivers. So the transport through the water was done. So like that, and along, along with the lake, along with the banks of the river, certain houses came, certain trade took place, certain shops came. So the economic activity flourished. And so we said, this is a civilization. So, civilization, not only civilization and culture, there's a difference. Culture is with your mental makeup. Culture happens the way you talk, the way you think, the way you, you know you celebrate your life. But uh, the material culture, like you know the houses, the bricks and the steel and other things, that is a civilization. Well, anyway, uh, I mean, uh, this is not a talk on civilization or... Uh, civilization or culture, but what I'm trying to say is even the culture has come from the environment. If you go to different places, today they wear different dresses, they, wear, they, they cook different food, 
the food in kerala is different the food in punjab is different because of the soil because of the micronutrients because of the temperatures because of the way of life there is determined by the kind of the environment that they have they use much less dress for instance we use you know earlier when i was sitting in a college some of my friends after serving senior friend they went to bombay they got job they came with ties and suits and all that i said why are you using ties you know because you know in our company they have asked us to wear tie and all to go to other companies and talk you know? i said look you know this tie and all that was started in england they were ruling us because they used to feel there used to be a lot of uh, you know the cold countries they had to wear these ties so that you know they feel warm in the neck and then they were wearing coats the women also were wearing so many kinds of layers around their bodies so it was all because of the weather it was because of the cold weather that they had similarly we don't have cold we are a tropical subtropical country so we have to see what kind of dresses are required now for instance you know the uh, tripur in in tamil nadu tripur there are about 5000 posseri industry five like they make this onions they make underwears they make you know today they make uh, even t-shirts and all that but today why when you, because you know we started talking from gandhi now this why i'm seeing this is the textile industry is the most polluting industry because textile uses a lot of chemicals lot of water lot of energy and the waste is let into the streams let into the lakes let into the rivers you go anywhere and see how the textile industry is functioning of course in the last 20 30 years the pollution control boards have become stricter they ask them to you know see that the waste water has to be cleared i mean you cannot leave the waste into the river there is a lot of fine and all that but even now why i'm saying is tripu there is a lake there is a river called uh, uh, novel novel river and i'm forgetting it is actually a tributary of kaveri river novel the waters have become turbid green thick water it was a beautiful river with lot of vegetation with lot of fish with lot of local population surviving on the banks of the river on the products of the lake on the products of the river but then they had to use this water even to produce about 5000 industry may imagine 5000 units 5000 is a major unit in this asia and then they had to clear the you know the river water and they spent about 10000 crores about 6000 crores were given by the world bank 2000 was given by uh, the puducherry and another 2000 was given by the madras government that is the chennai government tamil nadu government but still they had to use lot of energy and even today the waters are not clear they are just uh, you know cleaning the water they are recycling the water and using it so recycling also comes at a price it doesn't just you know you cannot put some chemicals and then mix it and then you know, make it top it or we and then throw no it has to come through lot of using lot of energy lot of machinery lot of people they have to pay there so we have to understand how it affects the economy in the sense why i mean economy is when you want to produce another product it comes at a higher price today the prices of many things have gone up the prices of food have gone up the prices of vehicles have gone up see i was just listening to a scientist yesterday who was saying that about 40 years ago we in england were a much happier people today we are using many many products we don't know where they come from england is not an industrial area anymore it is there but a lot of products which they are using come from other parts of the world they may be definitely they say there are a, the pollution laws are not may not be existing there or they may be existing but they may not be addressed to they may not be complied with so there are a lot of issues of pollution in the world from where we are getting our products and enjoying it here so what i'm saying is that environmental resources are not only we are exploiting the environmental resources we are also polluting earth we are also polluting uh, the water we are polluting the air and uh, we are of course living with this pollution no doubt about that as i was saying about bangalore now the lakes 
the lake you see bangalore I, I remember when i came here first during may i stayed in a hotel for one month i never used the fan nobody was using the fan doctor the, the, the oldest uh, the ophthalmologist of bangalore dr mitri mestri is a who told me that he grandfather he great grandfather his father they were all in this business of ophthalmology and he continued but he said our children i have seen we, we used to go during april may wearing sweaters in bangalore there used to be i mean the weather used to be so very selfless but today you don't see that in bangalore every house almost has a air conditioner fan every other company today that is built it doesn't have you know it is only built with glass and steel so there is no fresh air which enters into the building and then they use a lot of air conditioner which require huge amount of energy and then there are uh, you see at the back side of the building when you go you feel tremendously uh, you know i mean the heat is there produced because the air is let out there so there there are lot of issues like we have created bangalore with a you know a heat island we have soil one of the most important aspects of environment is the soil do you ever see soil maybe in nal there is a beautiful garden and all but when you come out in bangalore you will see the entire city is asphalted so where did the rainfall that comes and hits we have about something like more than 860 to 900 a mem of rainfall which falls in bangalore where does it go it used to fall it used to go into the storm water drains storm water drains were collected to various lakes as i said i said more than about 1000 but the big lakes were say about 400 here in bangalore they were all connected to that and the water used to go the lakes used to be filled the lakes were nice having nice uh, catchment area so and the weather was so celebrious people never use acs people never even use fans so there was not much demand for electricity but then with the coming in of the it companies it enabled services and all that today there are more than 500 multinational companies in bangalore and they have all you go to whether electronic city or pinya or you go to whitefield and we used to go to whitefield now you know don't think of going to whitefield because there is no way to reach whitefield within 2 hours it takes 2 hours if we have to go from chamraj bait or from jainagar to white field so this is how we have now we have to produce we have to produce a lot of our requirements how do our requirements come now they have to be produced at a higher cost that's what i'm saying there is no sustainability millions of people in this country there are say about 50 crore of people nearly 500 million people today they live almost uh, like a you know the lower middle class people they have no access to a real fresh good drinking water there are there are 2 billion people in the world they have no access to clean drinking water and healthy food so we have to see how many people are using only the resources of this world and only the media is talking about such you know people lot of media today they only talk about the nice thing the development and all that okay fine as dr mutkavi said development must be meaningful development must bring a sense of comfort you see happiness doesn't naturally come from the products it comes from the state of mind but how do you create that state of mind if you have a good environment yeah i remember when i was in dharwa until i studied my you know post graduation we used to go on cycle we used to go in the buses we used to walk to the universities we used to talk a lot with our friends we walked along the railway track under the trees we walked and came home but today the the children they even if they, are, they reach about 13 14 age they want to go on the you know the scooter they you want to use the two wheelers because they say oh no no we have to go for the tuition we have to go to classes we have to study more and then but what are you are you are studying but the kind of life you are living you are not thinking about it the kind of products that you are using like you know petrol you use, whatever the diesel you use the kind of clothes you use, 
Our environment doesn't depend only on planting trees. Our environment is a very comprehensive. We have to think of paper, we have to think of plastic, we have to think of wood. Where do we get our wood from? We have to think of how the cities are built. For instance, there are peri urban areas, that is the fringes of the city, where the villagers live you know, with minimum requirement of you know, money or minimum requirement of uh, various products. Because they, the peri urban areas are not withered, not destroyed by environmental pollution like our cities are. If you come into the cities, you'll see a lot of asphalting, you'll see a lot of vehicles, a lot of the air pollution lot of sound pollution, so many other kinds of things. But when you go to the peri-urban area, it is quieter. And there are a lot of lakes, there are a lot of grasslands, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, this thing, uh, the fields there where they grow vegetables, they grow fruits. But unfortunately, it is not an organized market. Their contribution to economy is quite big because the whole country, you must think of, we have only maybe about 30, 40 big cities like Bangalore, but the rest of the population lives in the small towns and the villages. That's what Mahatma Gandhi said. The Gram Swaraj, when he spoke about the villages, he, he did symbolize it. Not only symbolize, but he lived all his life. I think Attenborough showed it in his film so brilliantly when he was, when all the great leaders, uh, uh, Pandit Nehru and all these people were walking to the governor general of the British Mahatma Gandhi was walking with his stick when they came in the car. You see, this is beautifully shown. And then there is a Sabarmati Ashram where Mahatma Gandhi was giving the charka. And all these people go there, they have to talk to him because the partition was happening. They had to take a word from Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi did not even look up to them. He was just you know, waving the yarn. And then there is a sound where a boy from a village is coming with a goat, he's going towards the lake. And then Mahatma Gandhi listens to Babu, the boy, calls. He says, what boy? He says, sir, I'm going, taking my goat to the lake. Okay, wait there, I'm coming, he says. So he leaves all these big people and they are aghast. He goes out, takes the boy, and then he goes to the lake. Because he says, this boy needs my attention. See, these are some of the things which we have to understand. And Mahatma Gandhi spoke about small industries. See, uh, if you, the small industries, which Schumacher, the great economist from Germany, who wrote a book in 1973 called The Small is Beautiful. The small is beautiful in general, he says, when you have smaller projects around the community, don't have projects around corporations. But today, most of our DPRs, that is the detailed project reports, our blueprints and all that are for big corporations. Because they say we have to have big technology, and then big marketing, big distribution, big vehicles, or hundreds of other vehicles. So this is but the kind of pollution that we create, the kind of materials that we use, the kind of resources that we keep on mining from the earth. We have only one earth, we have to understand. We have one earth and we have billions of activities. We have to understand, if we have to understand the environment, we are not, I'm just talking about Bangalore because just give me an example. I'm, I'm sure you are all aware of this. There are many big cities in the world, many big cities in the world. I know, but these big cities have problems of law and order, problems of environment, problems of movement, problems of congestion, but if you go to a small town, you don't find it. Or if you go to a suburban area, you don't find it. There is something like tradition, culture. In big cities, we don't see the tradition and cultures. Can we leave? J.B.S. Haldane, the greatest physicist, I mean, one of the great physicists, who spent more than 30 years, 40 years of his life in India, he wrote a book and I read that book. In that he says, well, science and technology, because he himself was a physicist and also a psychologist. He said, yes, science is important, but I'm a little apprehensive about technology, he said. But every other person wants to do a technology product. 
and wants to bring it into the market, wants to price it and sell it. Well, if it is important, well, if it helps us, let us use. But not everything. You know, today many of our wants have become needs, like our telephones have become needs, vehicles like cars have become needs, scooters have become our needs. Uh, so many the computers have become our needs, but they were about 30 years ago, 30 or 35 years ago. These were just needs. They were not, they were just wants actually. But today our wants have been transformed into our needs. That is why we have to manufacture on a huge scale, on a big scale, using big technology, using big money. Not everyone, they have talent, but they don't have the capital to start anything. So we have to think of what Gandhi said, the small industry, for instance, he's Khadi. Khadi doesn't use chemicals, doesn't use electricity, doesn't use water. Because in my village, Eppardley, I have gone there, wherever I go, I go to this Khadi. There is a beautiful Khadi, big unit, which was started much before independence. And there I saw for the first time the women come. Of course, the women are doing it. They are not really paid well. They have to be, you know, actually paid well for doing eight to ten hours work. Anyway, what happens there is they don't use more chemicals, they don't use more electricity. Only some small bulbs are there. When they spin the yarn, and then Khadi is good because it is Khadi gives employment to uh, farmers and farmers grow cotton and our uh, soil is good for cotton in North Karnataka. That's why we have more Khadi units there. So we have to think of it. But we have to, we are wearing so many clothes today, even we are on wearing the textile products, you know, which are being there. They pollute the water, they pollute the stream, they pollute the soil, they pollute the air. And then we use more energy and more chemicals, which again helps, you know, global warming. Because we have to produce these chemicals. It helps, it increases the global warming. When the global warming goes up, the climate change actually happens. And our glaciers, for instance, the biggest glacier, the Arctic ice, sea, sea ice, it is getting melted. In the last two months, that is more than 5.8 million square kilometers of the sea ice has melted has plunged low. In the last 40 years, it has not been seen. Uh, you know, the kind of uh, the glaciers melting and uh, getting into the ocean. Now, if you look at these glaciers, that is a wide stop. And that is the biggest uh, one compared to Antarctic. Antarctic is 10% of the ground. So, if you look at the wideness, the wide, it reflects the heat into the atmosphere. It has kept the earth cooler for millions of years. The, whatever the equator receives the, the sunrise, I mean the sunlight and all that, it is reflected back by the glaciers, by the this year, the Arctic glacier into the atmosphere. And uh, but the global warming has been happening. The scientists would be able to tell us how long, because it is a wonderful study for scientists. Because if you study the you know the thick ice of the glaciers of this uh, I mean you know, Arctic Sea, then you will be able to understand how this uh, the, you know, the climate change has been taking place, how long it has taken place, the global warming, how long it has been happening, what has been happening, that the entire glaciers would be able to tell us. But now they are getting melted, and as they melt, they come into the sea. The sea has a warm water. The cold water comes and it changes the currents. When there is a change in the heat exchange, which they, you know, which happens in the sea, there is a warm water at the top, and then we have at the, at the lower level we have the cold water. When there so much of water comes and falls into the sea, it changes that. When it changes, then the storms, the gales, and all these, you know, happen, and they disturb our rain pattern. The hydrocycle, normal hydrocycle, undergoes a change. The rains are disturbed. We do not know when it is going to rain. We do not know how the fish is going to happen. I mean, the fish uh, is going to be available. Because a lot of uh, these uh, you know, abnormal things which happen to a normal thing, then we do not know what will be the consequences. So, these glaciers have to be kept cooler. They, because they have kept the earth cooler for millions of years. That's the reason we have all been living with seasons. 
the oceans produce the season the ocean produce the rains they you no know, and we don't understand perhaps the normal people in this world we keep on using a lot of products that are being manufactured we think we only need them and we want them so we have to understand these various environmental issues like our glaciers our oceans our rivers our lakes and try to protect them as much as possible now the forest india has two hot biodiversity hotspots one is the western ghat forest the other one is the himalayan forest these are two wonderful biodiversity hotspots they are also wonderful as a tourism packages there are beautiful valleys there are sholas there are wonderful rivers the western ghat forest has 65 rivers in the southern peninsula of india right from tapi river in in gujarat up to kanyakumari we have the spread of these mountains of wonderful forest the rain bringing forest the evergreen forest the deciduous forest the various kinds of biodiversity the biodiversity makes our soil fertile the biodiversity gives us medicine it gives us fragrance it gives us so much you know actually to understand the minor forest produce there are millions of people like the tribal or the people who live on the edges of the forest they use the minor forest produce like the flowers the uh, the honey uh, the honey that we get from the beehive there so many kinds of fruits that are there which are being grown well i have gone i used to go to goa many times went to belgaum from arwa it goes through beautiful forest and today we have also got to high court to stop the cutting of lakhs of trees between belgaum and uh, goa between arwa the road which goes from ramnagar to uh, londa and then castle rock and anmol there are such beautiful forest about 600 years ago the portuguese who came to india i mean who came to karnataka and he saw such great forests he saw he said this is a ocean of greens there is so many forests were there and then he traveled up to agumbe and from agumbe to castle rock he said this built is so wonderful that not a single tree should be felled here you know but today we have lost nearly 40% of the forest of the western ghats the western ghats are very good for precipitation of the arabian sea clouds the arabian sea brings us a lot of you know the rain clouds and they precipitate over the forest when it precipitates the rainfall comes the rain doesn't hit the ground like it hits here on the forest it falls on the stem it falls on the leaf it falls on various other there are canopies of the forest so it slowly percolates into the ground then there is a humus i mean nearly many many feet of humus when you walk into the forest you know when you don't feel even the big grains which come for instance that area that i am talking about the colorado i mean for in castle rock and all that castle rock is nothing but it's a bottleneck between goa and karnataka and then we have londa we have ramnagar we have uh, dandeli there are beautiful birds like the hornbills the local people believe the hornbills bring the rain so they have the festivals of the hornbills there we have black panther which is not to be seen everywhere but it is there in near dandeli in that forest right up to uh, uh, maharashtra so from tapi river as i said from gujarat up to kanyakumari we have these beautiful sholas we have great grasslands we are not not bothering about grasslands we have about 5000 acres of grassland near hesargatta lake here and grasslands are big carbon sinks they recharge a lot of ground water they have a lot of small animals like reptiles and all to survive and they help us in keeping the air cooler but we are consider the grasslands as wasteland they they are a big fodder for our cattle shepherds and the cattle i told the managing director of this uh, dairy when he had come for one particular one seminar where i met him and told him that you must tell the government that is 5000 acres of land are a great source of raw material for you because you are producing 85 lakh liters of milk every day which people use to make curds to make you know buttermilk and 
butter and all that and tea and coffee you are producing 85 lakh liters and mostly about 40 to 45 lakh liters you sell every day in bangalore where do your cattle eat the bottle you are bringing it from the market stall feed it which is not good see in dharwad when we have dharwad peda or belgam kunda because you see belgam is nestling with the western bath kunda it has given thousands of jobs to youngsters they make kunda one of the finest sweet meats of north karnataka dharwad peda babu singh who came from uttar pradesh to produce and he started producing dharwad peda he he was asked say how why people come and wait for wait in the queue to buy pedas from your shop he said sir the cows of dharwad and the mill and the lakes of dharwad are so good when the cows drink the water from the lake and eat the grass they have a particular aroma for the milk which i have not seen anywhere in india that's why i started making those pedas no keeping as an essence that uh, aroma of that in my pet so you have to understand how the food you know sustainably produced can really solve the problems of food we are wasting 40% of the food in the world that is why we are making our lifestyles unsustainable we are wasting 40% of the food it is a waste of not only we cook and waste it when we cook it we use energy we use water we use time we use steam these are all the resources which are wasted you see food waste is not only certain rice or chapati which are thrown away in producing that we are using we have to manufacture a lot of food. pressure cookers or whatever then we have to use gas cylinders we have to use electricity we have to cook the food we have to use the time so this waste has to be considered very serious similarly there are so many things that we waste that is why in environment they say three r's reuse and uh, you know reduce reuse and recycle if we follow that perhaps we will be able to sustain a lot of our uh, you know lifestyle in the sense of food and other other products which we are normally which we throw we have to understand from small things because there was one teacher bhagwat in basal mission high school who taught us he said you see mahatma gandhi never even used a new chapel for years he used to repair his own chapel so he's bhagwat was using like that he said you bring so many things from the market then you throw it away like the cartons boxes and all that he said you use it to keep your pencil to keep your pen to keep other things like your rubbers and all that so use that so your mind also gets involved in certain creative ideas when we don't get bored so there are a lot of things there when we use small things look at the small things try to reuse them recycle them we are becoming creative it is not just you know but today we we don't do that you know most of our youngsters are not being told about it we look at millions of children who spend time on you know playing games on the phone playing games on uh, you know this laptops and all that okay let them also learn i am not saying that not to use phone not to use but how to use it how to make use of a particular product because if any product is used you know by the scientist any product is thought of it's a design the way it is made the way resources are spent the energy is spent the money is spent the time is spent your creativity is spent should not be wasted that has to be important that's why even our education and policy towards environment has to change because we are not much using much of our education in teaching environment properly it's only now i have been uh, you know thinking about environment for the last 25 30 years well as i was talking about the western ghats the western ghats i mean i mean sorry sometimes uh, you know i just stay away from a particular line of thinking so the western ghats are important as a basis of civilization because western ghats bring a lot of rains rains do not hit today in the last 3 years there have been the director of uh, this uh, 
disaster management already he said because there has been a global warming and climate change so our southwest monsoons are becoming intensive and they bring a lot of rains so these rains are flooding our belgaum and bagalkot bijapur areas bijapur as you know you know was not normally was a drier place much before about 1000 or uh, 1400 years ago was much better but now we have a lot of areas in karnataka although karnataka has more forests compared to other four states like kerala tamil nadu goa and maharashtra karnataka has more forests of the western ghat nearly 19 and odd thousand square kilometers of forest we have we have seven rivers like you know shiravati and uh, uh, mahadayi kaji and all that so we have to understand how the rivers are born in the at the foothills of the western ghat because the rains that fall in the forest do not just you know go into the streets or go on on to so many other places they fall on the forest forest absorbs the rain percolates it into the ground water the ground water table is maintained the river fills it fills the river slowly the streams there are hundreds and thousands of streams in the forest in the gully the lower lying area they go and join the river the river flows continuously so mahadayi is one such river in bhimgad bhimgad has got bats which are endemic to that region you do not find that kind of bats they fly for 100 kilometers every day and they pollinate at the pest pollinators also so we have to understand that these various creatures beautiful animal species and all which are there. everything is important in this ecological you know science of the world and if we do not you know understand the ecological science the ecological importance the environmental balance we will not be able to have a better economy we will not be able to have a better life we won't be able to have a better future we are there because of the environment because of the soil because of water because of grass because of the vegetable all this vegetation so the western ghat forests have given us a great opportunity to understand our you know all people should understand it 65 rivers they produce lot of electricity light up millions of homes run hundreds of industry provide employment to lot of people although the dams of course the size and the design of the dam has to be understood because we have produced uh, you know in supa near dandeli by kali river a big dam that was not nearly necessary because we cut about 60000 hectares of evergreen forest they were thick evergreen forest and when we cut them and the rain started hitting the ground it took away a lot of you know the soil top soil and the top soil went into this uh, uh, the reservoir and uh, silted up the reservoir today the kind of electricity the amount of electricity that was being produced earlier like it was meant for about 7 to 8 8000 uh, megawatt but today we are only producing something like 4 and a half to 5000 so it is silted up you see the water but you know if you go below there is a lot of silt there it is difficult to remove the silt once the dam is built very very difficult badravati also had the same thing in hampi they had a lot of silt silted up it because we have to understand how to create that is why we need small that was i was talking about chumata who built who made who wrote this book called small is in the book he says your intelligence is not lost your concentration is not lost when you produce small projects around your community your resources are also maintained resources are not wasted and you become more creative you have i mean you have a better concentration on that when you big projects your resources are squandered money is squandered and there are people like you know engineers and so many people who start looking at the you know the fringes of this they would like to maybe i am not saying more about it anyway so the big projects to handle big projects to repair them to you know maybe certain certain you know technologies are very big and they have to be maintained but not all producing soaps or all these things we don't have to have very big project very big industry textiles think of that 
the world is thinking about Mahatma Gandhi who said these are the small products, Budi Kai Garike, small products which are made by human beings. We are not, you see, we are 130 crore people in this country. Well, is everybody uh, having a skill and having technology? They have, they have certain skills. The skills have to be modified in such a way, in tune with what we require. And then we have to produce those, you know, whatever we require, like maybe soaps, uh, clothes, maybe our homes. So we have to also think about architecture for the homes. Because we are producing the buildings which require so much of electricity, which require so much of, you know, fans and the ACs and all. I don't think this is really necessary. Because we are not, we are, as we are not a cold country where we have to have glass and steel and all that. We have to have fresh air. We have to have light which is enough, like Singapore is producing. They have, uh, many of their big buildings have uh, their own you know, solar lighting. We are doing, of course, no doubt about the solar lighting, but it has to be, it has to be, you know, expanded. It has to be done in a proper way because huge projects should not be done even for solar because they, on the long run, in the long term, they are becoming uh, unviable and economically and also environmentally. So we have to think about environment and and then uh, environment and sustainability because when we are eight billion people on this uh, on this earth, think of the kind of food that we require, transport we require, roads we have to make, and we have to have so many these products. What kind of uh, economic uh, policy is required for us? So we have to think about. We cannot have a you know, we see like a straight jacket economy. We cannot have economy like the Western countries have. We have to have our economy, looking at the skills of the people, looking at how many people live in the villages, their requirements. We have to think, you know, it's not a very easy thing, I know, but a lot of our sociologists, economists have to think about it. We only think about, we have to think about the peri-urban areas today. The peri-urban areas I was talking about, where our, you know, the carpenters, the drivers, and so many people who live today, they cannot live in the city like Bangalore, cannot pay rent, uh, high rents, and they cannot, their children cannot go to private schools. They have to go to government schools. But in the peri urban area, they can live better with uh, much less uh, money as rent, and they have their own small little places where they grow their own vegetables. They also can grow more and market it to the uh, outside world. Outside world means to the city life. So there are many, many issues. The environment, if you start speaking, then you touch upon everything. <laughs> because we need clothes, we need houses, we need transport, we need food, we need water, we need vegetables. We have to think of everything. So our government should think about it. Bureaucrats must think about it. They cannot just go on building cities. We have destroyed Bangalore. It is not very easy to you know, rejuvenate the resources that we have. Well, to replenish the resources, it is not possible. For instance, you use so much of steel and then you abandon it. You use so much of minerals, you abandon it. And what do you do? You have to only recycle, then it's a higher cost, higher energy. So we have to think of how to use this replenishing, I mean, the uh, renewable sources of energy, renewable sources of material, and then so that our life becomes economically much better and sustainable. So think of the sustainability. Think of saving our Western Ghat forest because they are created about 88 million years ago. We were a Gondwana, as we all know, Europe, Australia, Africa, India, they are all one, about 200 million years ago. Then they, they were, you know, then there was a shift in this, and then there was a split, and then we all separated. So we have to understand how we can live now and uh, with the better economic. Uh, that's what Mahatma Gandhi said. And the Stanford University, which brought out a report about seven, eight years ago on the environment, they put a lot of environmentalists, sociologists, thinkers, economists, artists, and then they produced why the world's economy, why the world's uh, environment is deteriorating. So they came to three points. I mean, they summed up three points. One was the increase in the population. The demands of the increased population on the products, that is the economic activities, 
the big economic agenda the world was changing so the volume of industries and economic activities was increasing every day and third was search for affluence that is everybody wants to become everybody wants to make a fast money we want to make out of commission we want to make money out of you know easy ways so this was what the stanford university said the easy way of making money and then they said these are the three things which are bringing a lot of global environmental deterioration we have to produce huge number of vehicles we have to produce you know put cables across the oceans and supply oil and petrol and all that kind of things which we are using and this is what is disturbing the whole economy and the environment and because of this you know we are also troubling our glaciers our uh, you know the arctic and the antarctic they are the sole protectors of this earth the earth has been cooler because of these huge glaciers they reflect back whatever the energy or whatever the uh, the light should be i mean the temperatures they receive from the sun are thrown back when it is more even from the equator it is thrown back into the atmosphere keeping the earth cooler oceans which create our seasons oceans which bring rains oceans which have really given us so much not only food they some people say more than 15 to 20% of the food of the world is given by oceans we are throwing tens of millions of tons of plastic into pacific and into arabian sea the indian ocean so this has to be stopped the atlantic ocean so somebody recently said that the glaciers of the uh, arctic are melted and coming into the oceans disturbing the currents and then there is some kind of a conveyor belt which will be stopped and then the rains will stop there will be no agriculture once the rains stop where do you find the agriculture so there are a lot of issues we have to think about and then uh, perhaps uh, i think i will stop here now because uh, i wanted to say something about himalayas there is a lot of over tourism we are also creating a lot of waste in the himalayan uh, region there they are also we have created a lot of problems for western ghat forests which are in the four to five states from uh, maharashtra goa goa is really going through a lot of problems so the entire goa economy depends not on industries but on their natural resources like beautiful rivers and the ocean the beaches and there they have also said that 2000 years ago the engineering skill of the people they created kajanas there is a drinking water sources of water which were less those days and then just 20 to 30 meters away is the oceanic water the oceanic water that is the salt water doesn't come and ingress into this drinking water so such was the engineering skill simple so they created all these things try to maintain them try to have our old houses architecture that's a beauty you see nature is such a marvelous thing it is such a beautiful thing So it becomes our India has, Karnataka has tremendous beautiful things which can be packaged as great tourism. You know, we are not thinking about that. So we have to maintain these places. We have to maintain our environment, and so that our economy can run sustainably. Sustainability is the word which is being used by many many big seminars today. What is sustainable? The nothing is sustainable as a matter of life. As a matter. Of because if we use only you know economically and uh, economically in the sense in the minimum in the minimum quantity only to your just minimum your requirement if we use the resources perhaps it will be a good economic uh, policy for the whole world and then we can also have a sustainable way of life so agriculture has to be maintained for the last 6000 years we have had agriculture and agriculture has to be maintained very sustainably because we are create we are taking away because when we destroy the biodiversity biodiversity which gives fertility of the soil micronutrients which produces uh, you know a lot of our medicines and all that is being disturbed we should not do that if the biodiversity is destroyed perhaps our life will be very difficult on this earth we have a huge monoculture see when we have not only vehicles we need also tubes and tires so to produce rubber earlier malaysia used to send 
all the rubber to produce, you know, the tubes and tires. But then there is so much of demand, it came to Kerala. Now, Kerala also is, oh, is trim with it. So, Keralaites have come into Karnataka and they have covered a lot of forest areas converted into monoculture of growing rubber crops. So, this monoculture is a very bad thing. Though the world has more than about 50% of this natural vegetation has been converted into monoculture, it may be sugar, it may be rubber, it may be tea, it may be rice, but it has to be looked at, you know, with uh, other uh, you know, vegetation. We have to have agroforestry. Then only it will supply, then it will, it will sustainably stay, it will be economic. Otherwise, with monoculture, we are going to destroy our environment of this world. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, it's good that you have taken us right from Bangalore city to uh, uh, Western Ghats to Arabian Sea to Himalaya, all these things. I wanted to share, sir, when I came out of engineering college, my first interview was with Bharat Electronics in 1990. And they have told me that you come to Bharat Electronics from railway station. Such a beautiful Bangalore, sir. Uh, yeah. We immediately thought I should get a job here, okay? And uh, we travelled from Majestic to Bharat Electronics. Only two buses used to run. That Mathekari road was totally a, a dry, totally kacha road, okay? And very nicely we went and found that time Bangalore. And today, as you said, it's total change. We are not able to want to go out to uh, move around. So that's how the change has happened. And it's a great message for all of us. And I will ask Dr. Mutkavi to give a vote of thanks, sir. Thank you very much. First of all, let me thank uh, Suresh Ablikar for uh, taking his time off and addressing us. I know it's a different method of addressing. Uh, he, is, he may not be seeing all the audience, even though he's expressing that, you know, he'd be nervous because there'll be a lot of scientists. But at least you're, we're all in a virtual world and we can be. And I was asking, please feel free because, you know, your domain is different, ours is different. And you come from a very different background. Uh, and I think today it was showing very well that, you know, his background is so different. And then, you know, like, uh, there are many things that we probably didn't understand. Uh, uh, it's very thought-provoking. So I just want to give a quick summary of uh, many of the things that you said. Uh, major emphasis he placed on the small products because uh, in, in Canada there is one uh, one sentence, honey honey good is rehalla. So the little, little things actually add up a great deal and we don't realize that. And therefore, you know, I think it's a very right emphasis because we just keep changing our mobiles and just for, for the heck of it. Uh, and these things can add up quite quickly. And the if you actually do a budgeting of the energy spent, etc., and I think that's what is emphasizing, it eventually has an impact on the global environment itself. Uh, so, uh, so he, he, and you also said you know big cities are becoming a pain today. And uh, he gave an example of Bellandurlu Lake, and in fact we are situated right next to Bellandurlu Lake. Uh, I didn't realize Bellandur Lake was so big till, you know, like uh, we were doing some flying lessons. When you see Bangalore, Bellandur Lake is one of the largest lakes and probably most polluted today. Uh, I think, you know, it will take enormous uh, effort and energy to clean it up. And if that is not done, uh, it will get worse and uh, uh, you will spend uh, more energy uh, to do that. And he spoke about desilting recklessly because then you lose nutrients and therefore, again, it has an impact on the fish and other things. Uh, one important distinction uh, he made is civilization is not culture. He made a distinction between civilization and culture. He said civilization is more of a material thing that what we see, for example, the buildings and this and that. But a cultural is more intellectual. And I'm not surprised that, you know, Heblikar mentions this coming from Harvard. Because Harvard is the home of some of the biggest intellectuals in uh, in Karnataka, uh, and he said it comes from environment. Uh, in this context, I remember one uh, one of my close friend, Dr. Sinha, used to say, "It seems Bismillah Khan was given, you know, an offer to go to U.S. Uh, and settle there. They said they will give you everything, they give you hope, this and that, and he finally asked, 'Will you give me Ganga?'" Hmm. Yeah. 
So because that is a, that is his inspiration because that's exactly where his music <coughs> came from. So clearly, you know, there's a lot of connect uh, with uh, what we do, and environment is actually the one which leads to culture is what he emphasized on. It's an important lesson. Uh, also, he spoke about the appropriate clothing, food habits, etc. Yeah. And I'm glad that he also mentioned about the Schumacher's small, beautiful book. Uh, we read that when we were an undergraduate uh, students, which also mentions about appropriate technology. And I think that's exactly what Gandhian message was. Uh, yeah. So it depends on what, what you want to do. I mean, not everything is applicable to everybody. And then Western habits need not necessarily be copied. But there are many things that people can contribute. And uh, again, the smallness is... Uh, uh, is actually big, okay. And then, uh, uh, so he, the other thing was very impressive was uh, the manner in which he described climate change in a very plain, simple words, which I think even young students can understand. I think that's an important language we used, and that's very important. I mean, we can probably use a lot of technical words, but then the for many people it will not impress or it will not understand why uh, that is so. You described the climate change in very simple, plain words, which I believe, you know, uh, I was really impressed by that one. Um, the other message was reduce, reuse and recycle. Uh, again, goes back to especially handling the small products. Uh, and one of the messages you are leaving us is think of sustainability, think of Western hearts. And I think, you know, maybe next time we'll talk about Himalayas as well. So yeah. very thankful to you for coming to us and, you know, spending this time. Uh, we do hope that you will uh, come to NAL when this uh, things get better. Uh, so, yes, and we'll have more illuminating discussions with you. Thank you very much, and I thank yeah, well, uh, Direct NAL for you know arranging all this. Uh, thank uh, and my colleagues, okay, uh, who have made this possible. So we will take your message well, and do visit us once again. Thank you very much. Yes, thank welcome. you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.